Greetings, I'm Michael Kelleher, director of the Wyndham Campbell Prizes. This virtual event comes to you from the traditional lands of the Quinnipiac people. With Yale University, we acknowledge that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shattuck, Golden Hill Pagasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquian-speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. Welcome to the final event of the Wyndham Campbell Prizes Virtual Festival. When we meet in person, the festival traditionally begins with a prize ceremony highlighted by the Wyndham Campbell Lecture, which is delivered by a distinguished writer who we ask to answer one question. Why do you write? We're honored and delighted that U.S. Poet Laureate Joy Harjo will deliver this year's lecture, an expanded version of which will be published as a book in 2022 by Yale University Press. I'd also like to thank our partners who have worked so hard to bring you this festival under extraordinary circumstances. Five O'Clock Films and Media, Matchbox Virtual Media, the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, the Yale University Art Gallery, Yale Center for British Art, the Gilmore Music Library, Yale Native American Cultural Center, Yale University Press, the Yale Review, the 2021 prize recipients who helped us conceive these events and to make them as special as they could be. And of course, our distinguished guest. After the lecture, we invite you to join Ms. Harjo and Professor Alana Hickey on Zoom for a live Q&A. Thanks to everyone for attending over the past nine weeks. We hope to see you in person next year when the prizes celebrate their 10th anniversary. And now, students from Yale's Native American Cultural Center have prepared a welcome for the Poet Laureate. Shio, I'm Truman, this is Nicholas, Mara, Evan, Sonny, and Cynthia, and we're all the Red Territory Drum Group. We're, we're an intertribal drum at Yale, and we're about to play a song for you, so I hope you enjoy. Stonewall for large cat, J5 to hold Jeff Kuros, East Timosco, well, you do is. Ma, Ogada, how you is, some monarch could say Bobali, Tonka. Yat e Shikinsale Houston this year. Hi, my name is Kinsale and I'm a poet, performer, student, and workshopper. And I still remember the very first time I met Joy Harjo. My experience watching her on stage was just the same as I'd always experienced her poetry. It was just breathtaking hearing her wisdom and her words. And as somebody who works with Native youth in workshop spaces and intimate spaces to create beautiful narratives and storytelling to generate conversations between ourselves and amongst one another and um, discuss our observations of land, of bodies, of the natural world. Her poetry has played such an instrumental part in my life and the lives of many other young poets. Buju, a sequin dishnakaz, makwan judame, mikanakwa ju, anishinaabe, shkuniganing, and dunji. Hello, my name is Sunny Persian. I am a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. I'm from the Turtle Mountain Reservation in Belcourt, North Dakota, and I'm a first year here at Yale. And I am so excited to talk about my favorite Joy Harjo poem, which is how to write a poem in a time of war and what it has meant to me. When I found this poem, I think I was just beginning to grapple with what it means to be an indigenous person and really work through the traumas that have been inflicted on indigenous peoples and how they continue to exist today. Throughout the poem, she continually writes, don't begin here, not here, not here, as she talks about the destruction that has gone on in the past. And I think it's really important to note that we have such a sticky past in terms of um, interactions with colonizers and how that has played out throughout history. It can often feel hopeless and during a time when I was kind of in this hopeless state of mind, this poem really helped me because she points to a specific moment during the poem where there's a grandpa praying for his grandchildren and he's praying for their love, you know, for their hope and for a good future for them. And she says, begin here. And I think that line is really significant to me because it reminds me to think about this idea of joy and hope and love as rebellion, especially when you live in a world that 
can be hard to get through sometimes, but there's so much good that is still left and there's so much to celebrate in ancestral love and hope and ceremony and prayer and all the beautiful things that have been left behind for us. Bonjour, my name is Madeline and I'm from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians from Northern Michigan and I am a first year in Yale College. Joy Harjo's work is particularly inspirational and important to me because of the practice of storytelling by women in my tribe. Uh, storytelling, especially storytelling through art, using poetry, dance, and music, is really important to Anishinaabe culture and specifically really important to Anishinaabe women. And so seeing Joy Harjo continue that tradition that a lot of Native communities share through her poetry is especially significant to me and being able to use her as a role model through that. I particularly connect with the piece Washing My Mother's Body. Um, my grandmother passed away this February and a really big part of healing uh, for both my mother and for me and my two sisters was sharing that poem together about the process of grief and how we connect to our mothers and women in our tribe. And so her work has been really special to my family and me, especially through the process of losing my grandmother and what that means in her poem Washing My Mother's Body. I think her poetry has always been a necessary tool for us to map out the world around us, but also gratitude and how that has always been a part of our communities and especially in poetic spaces and intimate spaces. How can we practice reciprocity, generosity and gratitude through poetry and through our connections and relations with one another? I just think that's so interconnected to the work that Harjo has always done, the work that she has brought into my life that I get to do. And she's just such an important part of where I love to spend my time and what I love to do. And I just wanted to share a very small excerpt from a poem. We wrote it after Praise the Rain in this workshop, working on praise poems, but it goes, Praise my mother, praise her hands. I fear I write about hands too much, but sometimes they're all I remember. Navajos are hairless, my mother laughs, smoothing down the skin of her palms. The sound rolls like ocean waves, ghosts of prehistoric oceans that blanketed the Utah grounds where we sit. When I am going through especially tough days or things just feel especially dark or um, it's just hard for me to work through my own traumas or the traumas of my people, I continually go back to this poem because Joy Harjo reminds me that there is so much beauty left in this world and it's important to appreciate it while we're here because that is what our ancestors want us to remember and that is the life that they want us to live. Why I write, or catching light in the dark. And I still believed in the light and what it makes of us from the poem One Summer by Anne Margaret Lim. I speak to you from Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation. We are at the border of three native nations that also include the Osage and Cherokee. We honor and acknowledge the keepers of the lands lands represented by all who are gathered here in this digital room. We acknowledge those original keepers, past, present, and future, who came from these lands. As we gather here, we acknowledge the source of the gifts of our living, for without this earth, or Jaga, we would be without shelter, clothing, food, or inspiration. Consider that the earth, mind, architectures, and aesthetics shape the mother root of our imagination here. Hagasane, Isagira Masi, Poma Di, Moe, Tawigas, Pogahoyan, Ye, Gia Di, Mon, Agathlechka, Heathlin.
a B.A. Yothless. I do not know when the first poem was, where it came from, or exactly how. I just know how much I needed the scrawl, the questioning, the words lining up in a musical sound sense to make something from the everything of nothing. I was in the dark and decided to investigate the dark to find the light. I came to writing poetry because I needed a language that was beyond ordinary. I was not a speaker. I was the silent one who sat in the back, often caught up with invisible wars from fresh present to an historical past that revealed itself to me in shards and waves. I spoke everyday language, a colonized English. The further away I moved from my growing up home in Oklahoma, the taller I stood. It was in the lands of the Southwest that poetry found its way to me, in words that were given context and lift from red mesas, pinon trees, and the light filtered by mountains where so many left prayers through eons of history. My origin story of writing poetry would begin there, after I arrived at Santa Fe's Institute of American Indian Arts, which was then a Bureau of Indian Affairs Residential Arts High School with a two-year postgraduate program. We were Native students from tribal nations throughout what is now called the United States. All of us there because of a demonstrated proficiency in one of the arts. I was accepted based on my drawings. And while I was a student, I never took any of the creative writing classes. I was a studio art student who found her way to the drama and dance classes and became a member of one of the earliest American Indian drama troupes. These performances began with attention to words and how they evoked movement, gesture, and meaning. To perform, I learned that the storehouses of silence that I carried within my slight, youthful body could be useful when it came to expressing a character or characters in the playhouse of good and evil. An actor is a walking, metaphorical being. They are who they are as an accumulation of knowledge and presence, merging at a crossroads of time and age. And they are yet another possibility of being who finds expression through them, a being brought into the present by words. Artists are aware of the metaphorical aspect of their creations, since that their work is prayer, not a prayer to the white, patriarchal, angry god of judgment, but an immersion in a flood of creative brilliance larger than the human imagination. It was also during those early years there that we young Native artists were discussing our predicament, the challenges of expressing ourselves in our arts as individuals, as members of clans, tribal bands, and nations, each with a particular ancestry even as we collectively battled issues of social justice. We were the generation that changed the face of American Indian art as we challenged stereotypes and tropes that prophesized our extinction. We found groundbreaking ways to make fresh paths over our ancient trails of concept, design, and architecture. What I garnered from those earliest years in the Southwest was an attention to light, to the arrangement of mountains and high plains. I could see the sky and even beyond the sky, and I was coming to learn that words were ladders, each rung led between the darkest of hours to sunlight, from confusion to accomplishment, or in the opposite direction. I often think in oppositions. I don't know why I am wired this way. It could be the effect of cultural impasse or collision. So my writing attempts to find a passable road in chaos. Creation and destruction, then, must find a way to come to the fire together and get to know each other. If there are creation stories, then <laughs> there must be destruction stories or stories of endings that put to rest a particular episode of living. In Greek, not Greek, mythology, Charon is the ferryman of Hades, the world of the dead. He helps new souls cross over the river Styx. 
The souls must have been given proper ritual or they are not allowed to cross. That left a lot of souls wandering, and I wonder if Earth is the major wandering station. I often find myself in this state of questioning, which is much like wandering in a state nowhere near Oklahoma. Poetry is my canoe. The cracks through which I fell became sheaves of lightning. It was 50 years ago that I began this word venture as an undergrad student at the University of New Mexico. A single mother with two children, and sometimes three, who went to school full-time, starting out as a pre-med major with a minor in dance and changing the first year to studio art, my original career intent. I became involved with the Native Student Club, the Kiva Club, and met real Native poets and writers like Simon Ortiz and Leslie Marmon Silco. I worked long hours with my research position at American Indian Studies and my full-time slate of classes and the day-to-day child care. The night became my solitude. I've always needed solitude, yearned for it when it was scarce. I'd stay up nights painting and drawing, and then poetry elbowed its way in. When I thought I had no more room, my long nights then became a tug of war between poetry, artwork, and figuring out how my little family would make it on nearly nothing. My first poems were published a year later. In 2022, it will be 50 years since my first published poems. In these 50 years, I have come to the conclusion that ultimately it's about catching light in the dark. Poetry and other forms of writing can be useful as a tool for finding the way into or through the dark, or a device with which to admire the complexity of the stories in which we have become entangled. Sometimes the only way out is by voice, following the music into the impossible. At the heart of every creation is a need to connect even if it is to connect to no one in silent defiance. When solo on a kind of existential island, the inner world is even more immense than the measured world we have created out of wants, hunger, and sometimes need. Every word marks an act of creation, an intent, and often not a studied intent. We make ceremony with words, even as our words can lead us to the hells of destruction. This is one of the most potent teachings of the earliest attempts at writing poetry. I have come to see the process as a kind of call and response. Silence calls out, as do the kinds of voices that can only be heard when silence is presence. The poet listens with pen, pencil, in hand, or hands poised above the typewriter or keyboard, adrift in the orality of making words and finding out where they are going. I feel compelled to use the symbology of words, phrases, sound, music, and metaphorical import, above all, play, to listen then respond. It's a back and forth. The road isn't always clear. There can be jams, wrecks of questions, belief on its knees, mountains of sand or fires, And you learn with practice that these are part of it. We can go under, over, through, or around, or be lost. The Laguna Pueblo novelist, poet Leslie Silco, in her stories and poems, often references the storyteller who one day was so immersed in the story that she disappeared in the story, never to be found. She essentially became, or becomes the story. Though the generations lost in virtual worlds and texting may not agree, to connect in person is more potent and powerful. There is less ability to lie and be deceptive. Words are accompanied by clothes of gestures, expressions, tonality. We are in a living communicative atmosphere 
even if communications by words fails or leads to misunderstanding. The field is dynamic. Consider what happens when a live poetry reading or music performance morphs to the audio of radio, the next audio married to visual as in music videos, to virtual with earbuds or earphones when the listener is alone on an island of perception, or reading in books when reading silently and alone. There is a difference in experience that takes you further away from the presence of living words. Consider the distillation of experience in texting. Words are abbreviated. Symbols and acronyms are the gestures. There is no long slope of evolvement that allows communion. We lose out on a wider band of perception along the way. Yet, if you turn this construction upside down, you might argue otherwise. The symbolic undergirding of texting is a coding with expansive leeway. With our audio devices and books, we can carry worlds with us, and we are connected. Then we are back at the communality of performance and what it gives. Speak singing is how I first considered the expression of poetry as an entity, a being, because my mother sang her poetry And as she sang, the images and words through her voice made a living story, presence. I heard how deeply she loved my father and how she suffered for that love. Songwriting was natural for her and was how she revealed her deepest, unspeakable self. My mother spoke and sang poetry in the everyday of our living. She wrote on an Underwood typewriter the most compelling object I had ever seen. It was a magic word machine. With it, she created entities called songs that traveled throughout the house to embrace, even protect us when the schism between her imagined love and the reality of my father's capriciousness grew and crossable. She would go into a local studio and make demos to send to Hollywood for publishing. In those earliest years before I was seven, she knew and sang all the top hits on the radio. Lyrics surfed chordal structures with melody. She recited the poetry she had learned in the two-room school of her eighth-grade education. Her favorite poet was William Blake. We put the words to foot action and jitterbug to Buddy Holly or later did the twist with Fats Domino and ached with Patsy Cline and her song Crazy and fell in love with the croon of Nat King Cole. It was all connected, this poetics of listening, word making and dancing. There was power to transform, to lighten the heaviness of the burden of being human. That's how I came to understand the power of poetry and music. It was a tool, but more than a tool. Words and music evoked a state of mind that literally lifted us up when racial and historical despair threatened. My mother's predominant song genre was ballads. They were written as her beloved wandered from us into the arms of women, sometimes her friends in the same clubs in which they had met, partied, and danced together. I first wrote Into the Arms of Ghosts instead of Arms of Women in the above sentence, because what inspired my father's need to wonder was his being torn from his mother when she was put away first for tuberculosis, then by death. This was before he had words or an understanding large enough to encompass the hurt. My father grew up in a 21-room house, bought with Indian oil money, then was sent to a military school in Ponca City by his father and stepmother, not long after she brought her own family of boys into the house when his mother died. Then they had a daughter together. 
I never heard my father quote poetry or sing. His silence was the speaker. Words were utilitarian and for the most part did not belong to him. A then young native father who was lost in a society that was constructed over his culture. He was marooned between English and Muskogee. He passed on to me the urgency to find a way out and through. It was unspoken. He was a dancer. I feel the same thrill move through my feet that moved through his when music took hold in the dark after the lights turned down. My way became poetry and eventually music. In poetry, there is that same thrill when the music takes hold. Each of us is a song. That song was carried from the beginning of creation, an ember carried from the original ancestor of our mother line. All has been sung and is being sung into existence. I do not separate poetry from singing. Every sunrise is a song and makes a continuous dawning all over the world. It connects all of us, daughters and sons, by thought, by heart, and so on. And on all of us, humans, animals, plants, planets, universes, deities. If you look to the traditional power of using words, stories are for teaching, event, entrancement to carry forth memory as a truth or fiction. Songs and oratory are used particularly for praise, grief, for planting, growing, to call love or someone to you. Songs can turn a storm. I have the power to travel and to assist you while traveling and especially potent in your own indigenous language. Words can be manipulated into spells that can make someone pay attention to you without their will. There are rules against using words to ensnare or otherwise harm. All depend on oral delight to open a pathway. Every song or poem has a purpose, or it would not be living. One of my first real poems appeared to my hands from my imagination to combat fear. It's not as if the poem suddenly appeared to me as in an oral vision, and I transcribed it, that's not exactly how poetry happens. The materials of a poem or a song come from many places, times, and even memories that might not be your own personal memories. The process of a creation begins years before you approach the page or screen. It is a gathering together of perception and sound as you accumulate experience and knowledge on this road of becoming. A gesture will be evocative and implant itself, such as the eyes of a warrior, as she or he turns from the last gaze at his or her beloved, or a black butterfly who came with a message from someone just departed from earth. Much is gained through nuance, through what is not said, in what is ineffable. The tools for writing can be sharpened with listening, reading, and practice. The practice is ongoing. I have always been attracted to poem songs that have a specific stated purpose, that are made to go out and accomplish a literal task. I think of Lewis Oliver or Little Coon, Muskogee poet who wrote a song in the shape of a snake. It was more than a snake. Or translations of older songs from our tradition that can stop a storm, which I will not speak here because they would be out of context in time, language, and place, and could be dangerous in a distorted form. Love songs serve similarly to praise a beloved or to turn them in your direction, just as breakup songs serve to sever, even act for revenge. That fear poem came during those early days of writing when I questioned why poetry found a most unlikely companion in me. I didn't fit anywhere. I was a struggling full-time student. I had a job at Native Studies researching Native art and was raising two children alone. That was struggle enough. However, there was another plane of consciousness on which I was fighting every night that 
I lay down to rest. As I slid into the borderlands between waking and sleeping, negative beings attempted to pull me into their darkness. I learned to escape them by using words as rungs on a ladder to bring me back. The words needed force from the gut to give enough power to emerge from their reach to a place where these beings could no longer exist as a threat. I was told by my poetry self to lift myself up with words, with songs. They would change my being, and I could no longer be destroyed by that which wanted to enslave or destroy me. With each new poem, story, or song, I need to be challenged, opened to the impossible, then restored. This happens with a call and response between my spirit and the light of knowing. I ask questions, listen, then find the musical waves upon which to write. I never know where I am going or how I will get there, and that's the thrill of it. Time, experience, and the ancestors have taught me that it is while practicing our arts and in ceremony that we come closest to who we really are as individuals, as part of a family, a generation, a country, a planet, a timeless point of experience. It is then we come into close contact with our ancestors, the origin. We must feed that place, honor it. I consider my poems, stories, or music compositions as houses or transforming stations. I must tend to the form, the architecture, even as content dictates the style, shape, and mode. The location of these houses, though they may appear in pages or in recordings, is in the liminal of the imagination. What a country that is. The liminal of the liminal is where the most unusual forms and possibilities live. This territory is marked by the kinds of forms that live where all possibilities of light shooting through dark gather. To speak and sing a poem into place will make it stay if there is a beautiful and stunningly created place for it to stay. A house is not limited to a hut, a shed, a larger single family home, or even a vehicle. The beloved earth can be considered a house, a house of earths, a myriad and diversity of plants, animals, rivers, waters, trees, and many kinds of living beings. The sky is the roof made of cloud sun and is a place of envisioning, of calling out to helpful forces. The ocean and below earth are the dominion of unseen and unknown hopes and fears. In our Muskogee cosmologies, these are the middle world, the upper world, and lower world. The heart is the fire in the house that gives light. My house is the red earth. As scribes of our generation, we are called to remember what matters. We always begin the story with the land, how it is regarded, our relationship to it, and how we move about on it, how we honor the keepers of the land, how we give back our materials from baskets, painting and sculpture, implements, instruments, inspirations, designs, architectural concepts, song, concepts, and stories are directly tied to some aspect of land, landscape, and place. Many of our origin stories involve emergence from the land, or they detail how we arrive here in this place. Our relationship to the land defines how we understand our place in the world. Our cultural stories live within our DNA and unwind through our lifetimes as singular entities and as native nations and countries. One Muskogee origin story says that we emerged from darkness into this place where we were given everything we needed. We are cautioned to take care of what was given to us. We share Turtle Island with all plants, animals, and natural forces. When we veer from tending that connection, then we dim the light. When we build walls at borders, we destroy the light within all of us. When our need for oil destroys the homes of caribou and polar bears, then we are destroyed. During a convening of Native Arts and Cultures Foundation mentors, an Anishinaabe mentor, Wayne Minogajig Valier, said, We are not losing the birch trees. 
the birch trees are losing us. To regard the earth or Ganajaga as a person, as a mother, is not a romantic notion. Understanding this will be essential to our survival. To understand this relationship means that we have respect for life, for the mother principle, for women who stand alongside men, not beneath them. In this collective earth crisis, we are experiencing the outcome of disconnection, of breaking universal laws that appear in the original teachings of most cultures in the world that state, do not take more than you can use. Respect life. Respect the giving of life. And give back. When my third granddaughter's body was forming, I watched and listened to what was going on in the atmosphere. To give a clue about this upcoming family member, what she would need once she arrived, to take on her part of the story. A powerful story was making the rounds in the native community where I was living in New Mexico. There was a native woman of a righteous nature who lived far out on the reservation in a hogan, the traditional home of the Navajo or Diné people there. She still prayed every morning with cornmeal, tended the altars of living, took care of her sheep, and was loved and well-respected by her relatives and neighbors. She was also blind. She was visited one day by the Holy Ones. As her hogan filled with the powerful presence of sacredness, the Holy Ones told her, as they towered over her, that they came to give a warning to the people. We are nearing times when we will experience earth changes, famine, and strife because people are forgetting their original teachings. The Holy Ones instructed her to tell everyone to keep hold of their traditional ways, which meant attending to prayer and minding their attention in all things, because it matters for the outcome of the people, for all life forms on this earth, or they will suffer. The traditional ways and rituals of all of Earth's peoples are kept in containers of poetry, song, and stories. It is how we know who we are, where we are coming from, and who we are becoming. I knew that my granddaughter was bringing in special gifts that would assist with these times we are moving into, times in which we are reckoning with our lack of respect and attention to what matters in this place. I told this story at a performance in Flagstaff near one of the sacred mountains. Many of the Dene people there nodded their heads in remembering. For holy ones to touch down in that manner is powerful and dangerous. Everyone must pay attention. Afterwards, one of the women came up to me and remarked, I saw the footprints of the holy ones in the sand in front of the Hogan. They were very long and narrow. The times the Holy Ones spoke of, we are in now those times. In this time, at the crossroads of brokenness, we are watching and listening for what stories will nourish us. At this cliff edge of becoming, there will be no turning back. These are the times that invite tricksters who disturb the waters. It was in a time like this that Robert Johnson, blues guitarist, met the devil at the crossroads one humid night somewhere in the dark of history. It is times like these we face the most cunning of tricksters. We might even find a trickster in the seat of power. We've always had clowns and tricksters in every culture. They inhabit the power places because their role is to remind us that Though we may hold and even wield power, power does not belong to us. It is meant to be shared. The United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, adopted in 1948, defines genocide as an attempt to destroy a people in part and whole. It is a crime under international law 
the phrase cultural genocide is not particularly used, but in the definition genocide may include anything causing serious mental harm to a group, said Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin in Vancouver, B.C., in a speech when she referred to Canada's treatment of its Aboriginal people. She stated that cultural genocide began in the colonial period. Cultural genocide occurs directly when a people's language, cultural ways of moving about and knowing the world are systematically destroyed. When the roots, the children, are taken away to be raised in a system that lacks nourishment. Within a few generations of the first immigrant settlements in this country, the population of native peoples has gone from nearly 100% of the population of this country to less than one half of 1%. We are not present as human beings. We exist predominantly in the form of stereotypes as sports mascots. Redskins is a deeply rooted image that is proving nearly impossible to dislodge. The word refers to the bodies of natives brought in for bounty by those who wanted us removed. This travesty of representation would not be allowed for any other cultural group in this country. Yet, for natives, it remains, even though there would be no America without us, without our contributions to the American form of democracy, to American arts and cultures, and humanities. We are not apparent in the cultural streams that establish and define American thought, art, and culture. We are not present at the table, though we appear perpetually at the Thanksgiving table every Thanksgiving in the stories told to our children in educational institutions across the country. But natives were not there at that table. There was no table. Their heads were on stakes giving warning around the newly constructed towns by the settlers built on native lands. These false narratives of native nations peoples continue a story of cultural genocide. These same false narratives have fostered a destruction of the natural environment in which we live and grow children, grandchildren, and which we make a world in which to continue. What joins the original cultures of these lands is a shared belief system in which we are not separate from the land or from the consequences of the stewardship of these lands. These lands aren't my lands. These lands aren't your lands. We are the land. Together we move and moved about with the knowledge that we are not at the top of a hierarchy. Rather, we are part of an immense field of knowledge and beingness and human contribution. Though crucial is not the most important, all have a place. What use do humans have in this bile system? Are we necessary to earth ecology? Like many other natives, I have resisted efforts to be linked as a native person to our personhood being synonymous with the land, because in past narratives, it has been used to dehumanize us. In the Papal Bull of 1450, Pope Nicholas V issued to King Alfonso V of Portugal the Bull Romanus Pontifex, declaring war against all non-Christians throughout the world and specifically sanctioning and promoting the conquest, colonization, and exploration of non-Christian nations and their territories. Pope Nicholas V directed King Alfonso to capture, vanquish, and subdue the pagans and other enemies of Christ, to put them into perpetual slavery, and to take all their possessions and property. Cultural genocide means the destruction of the essentially cultural legacy of what is American. There is no American without all our tribal nations, without the acknowledgement of our arts, cultures, and humanities, without the rich and varied contributions of the people and communities of these nations. Despite the history, the cultural repression and disappearance attempts, the damage, and even the carnage, we have persisted. We are resilient. 
Within our arts, cultures, and expressions of humanity, we have tended and envisioned ourselves as full members of resilient and living cultures. We are in the present. It is in our cultural and artistic creations that we have freshly rooted images, sounds, and stories that can restore the American story, that can assist in the care and respect of the environment and in the betterment of quality of life for human beings and the earth herself, Uganda Jaga. The old ones urge and remind us, remember, remember to remember. The first song I wrote came from grief, a wailing by a community for someone who gave up everything to pursue justice. The need for justice was a primary motivator of my first urge to write poetry. Our words had to matter, and what better way to make them sharp as arrows than with poetry? In February 1976, an unidentified body of a young woman was found on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. The official autopsy attributed death to exposure in alcohol. Against normal protocol, the FBI agent present at the autopsy ordered her hand severed and sent to Washington for fingerprinting. This was a deliberate mutilation, what John Trudell rightly called an act of war. Her unnamed body was buried without family, without ceremony. When Anna Mae Pictuaquash, a young Mi'kmaq woman, an active American Indian movement member, was discovered missing by her friends and relatives, a second autopsy was demanded. She had been killed by a bullet fired close range to the back of her head, not of alcohol consumption and exposure as had been reported. I had seen Anna Mae from a distance at a Native rights gathering somewhere in the Southwest. She was forthright, funny, and following a vision that took her far from her home and her children. Ten years later, I was studying jazz in Denver. I wrote a poem to commemorate her life, her purpose. I wrote to hold memory so that those coming up, my children and grandchildren, would not forget her, would not forget our struggles for justice in a country that had been nearly 100% indigenous and within a few years reduced to one half of 1% indigenous. And a few years after that, I pulled out this poem around which to craft music, to hold it, to carry it even farther out into the world. The Sisseton Wapiton Dakota attorney and drummer Susan M. Williams and I wrote the song and performed it at the KUNM radio station in Albuquerque. That began the era of our band that became known as Joy Harjo and Poetic Justice, an all native band of a poet and mostly native attorneys all working for justice with poetry and music. My saxophone was my singing voice. The most powerful poetry is birthed through cracks in history, through what is broken and unseen. When the despot ineptly sought to turn the country to a totalitarian nightmare, where was poetry? It wasn't sleeping. It kept the poets up at night. We wrote against despair, towards beauty, towards a truth that could imprison us for making a liar out of the fool who deposited himself in the seat of power, kept there by his puppets who kneeled in piles of promissory notes. As I wrote, I knew that Chofi, or Rabbit, was somewhere nearby, kicking up dirt as he made his way from some mess or the other that he started to show us who we are in the story of forgetfulness. As we wrote, we witnessed democracy dangled by an armed mob from the steps of the Capitol, a viral pandemic elbowed through the barrier of hatefulness to infect us. We who thought we had a drug for everything, and we kept listening and writing. Writing itself is an act of affirmation, even of sovereignty, we confirm that we are human beings, that we are alive and making and breathing culture. 
I often think of that woman in my poem who is hanging from the 13th floor window in Chicago and of her family, and I wonder what poem she is making, what art, because she found a way to climb back up again. I do not understand this path of writing. I take on this task, and as I do, I take up faith and wear it as a shield. Every time, I must keep my eyes open and see what I do not want to see. Keep my heart open and know that I can do what I thought I could never do. This, every time I pick up a pen or place my hands on the keyboard to write. To write is to make a mark in the world, to assert I am. There is no I without the vertical of family or poetry ancestors. There is no I without the horizontal of the community that includes trees, other plants, animals, the forces of water, air, sunlight, and all other earthly beings. I mark the doorway with ink marks. The doorway is imagination. In first grade, we were introduced to writing. My awareness of marks making sense before I could read circles back to opening children's books to be read, or it was the Bible, the only book in our home. I remember the little golden books, brightly illustrated, thin, cheaply bound, 25 cents per copy on a rack in the local grocery store where my mother bought groceries on credit every week as she paid off the bill for the previous week. We didn't have extra money for books, and my mother did not take us to the library. I did not share her trepidation when it came to books and higher education. I ride my consciousness and ask it to take me to the first place in this life I became aware of the power of words, of how sound formed itself in words and music. This isn't the first time I've asked. I stall out there. Perhaps there was never a time that I was not aware of the power of words. Perhaps. I am a body created by words, a body of words and of word-making. I lose words when I feel lost in a wash of tasks, like now, when the most poignant moment of the day is stepping out the back door of the apartment building to the parking lot, then down the stairs to take out the trash. The sky is piled with cloud beings, the air humid and hot, the center of the universe thick with visitors. I have missed speaking with clouds. They speak in poetry and metaphor. Every poem is a prayer, a supplication in the cacophony of humanity. There are more words now than ever, and there are so many so fast on the Internet and being texted that they have lost their innate power. They are not cared for, and so many are lost and scattered. I am lonely for lullabies sung at night. I am lonely for the man singing beautifully out of tune on the street up to the window holding a beloved. I am lonely for the first words of the baby and the toothless smile of accomplishments that follows. Lonely for the speaker bringing us all into the circle together by clan and ceremonial ground. Lonely for the voice of a mother who plants poetry in her children. Lonely for the sound of wind in the corn plants that have been sung to as they rise up from seedlings to God figures beneath the sun. There are some words I would like to call back. There are words that have been knives of separation, words of treaties that stole land and children, words of contracts that have taken the last sense from the poor, demeaning words, cutting words, Words meant to destroy, words that take you so far away from me, my girl. I will use words to call my spirit back. These words are made of mists of myth, made of architectures of restorative history, made of ancient songs of coming together that lift us over and through to beauty so that nothing or no one can ever be lost or uncared for again now or forever. It is the 100th year anniversary since the Tulsa Race Massacre. It occurred just a few blocks from where I am living, from where the wealthiest black community was in the country in 1921 called Black Wall Street. 
Black Wall Street was burned down and many of its residents killed by white citizens who were fueled by racism and hatred. As the search goes on for mass graves, poems are being commissioned and written as testimony and witness. So this act will not go unremembered, unspoken, so that maybe the future generations can listen and take heed. During this time, I keep returning to the poem by Natasha Trethewey, Imperatives for Carrying On in the Aftermath, for Illumination, to give ritual to grieving for moving on, She concludes her poem with, Ask yourself what's in your heart, that reliquary, blood locket, and seed bed, and contend with what it means, the folk saying you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest. Or like you, you carry her corpse on her back. There are many corpses on the back of this country, and we will continue to carry them until we have the right tools, the right words to bury them, so that the fertile human field of becoming can flower with justice and equality. We can change the story, the story of a violent hierarchy that follows in the wake of the Popple Bulls proclaiming indigenous peoples as non-humans for land and resource theft and slavery to manifest destiny which opened up the West and the world for the taking, set in place a caste system that places value according to skin color, culture, sexual identity, and economic standing. We can turn to honoring female power without whom there is no life. Rivers, mountains, lands, other animal and elemental inhabitants will be respected co-inhabitants. Once a story was given to me in a dream after a moral impasse in a creative writing teaching job. I called out to the dark, how do I change the story? That night, the dreaming took me to that deep inner pool of stories. The ones that are most useful when brought into the light. As artists, We are on alert for such insights because our art demands that we are challenged, never comfortable. We often find ourselves at aesthetic, artistic crossroads. Then we need our dreams to show us the way to change the story. We do not only dream as individuals, but we also dream as a collective. Within and through Each of us is a network of plants, animals, natural forces that nourish and give mind, heart, and spirit sustenance. It's important to acknowledge the ancestors and thank them, especially as we begin any endeavor. Let's acknowledge these beautiful lands which have made a place for people and nations from all over the world to come together and find a way. Let's acknowledge the original keepers of these lands Native peoples of this hemisphere did not disappear. We are not in the past tense. Acknowledge the gift of our minds, our spirits, and bodies, or should I say body, as this earth is one person. And remember to take good care always for these vehicles of movement into understanding, knowledge, and compassion. And ask for assistance as we write ourselves into the future as we carry the past with us. Every place has guardians whose responsibility it is to tend that person or place. These are guardians of cities, mountains, plants, and animals for all beings and states of mind on this planet Earth. These guardians are real, and in healthy societies they are active. When the guardians or keepers of these lands are forcibly removed, massacred, and their life waste stolen through the theft and warehousing of children, when female power is no longer standing equal with male power, then the lands suffer. We all suffer. The waters become polluted, fires are out of control, storms become massive and aggressive, and the earth trembles. There's confusion and destruction among all those who inhabit this land. 
these times. What will we know when this page is done? Who will we be? Will we survive the fires, the hatred, the heat, the rage? We must be ready to reopen the wound and even open to revising the story. And that is done by the artists, the thinkers, the dreamers, those who can envision from within this immense field. And indigenous artists must be part of the leadership and the revision of the American story. I bow down to the story keepers, to the keepers of poetry. I am reminded of the water spider who, when the earth was covered with water, carried an ember on her back so we could make fire to keep the story going. Everything is a prayer in the becoming as she approaches us, swimming through time. I was a reluctant writer. I tend to see the forest, all the layers of possibility, all time, which makes it very difficult at times to focus because I can get lost and not know where to start. And how will I know everything? The most powerful moment is just starting. Start anywhere to catch the light. <laughs>